As a child, my parents owning a camper meant one thing. We drove from where we lived, which was nowhere, to somewhere else that was nowhere. And because the destination was uniformly a campground, I meant we were not going to one of my favorite places, which was Six Flags or my grandmother's condo on the beach. Those were special events, and 1981 had already seen not only a trip to both Six Flags and the beach, but we had visited the queen mother of all places luxurious, Disney World as well. So my big boy Mickey Mouse teacup hath runneth over, and I was happy to settle into the bliss that were the BLTs being served for dinner on a random picnic table in the middle of God knows what forest in the middle of some state that started with an I. <laughs> this would not be a complaint, however, because I was in a camper which is basically a small house that drove, a concept that was completely mind-blowing and endlessly exhilarating to the seven-year-old me. On very special trips, I got each s'mores, which was especially exciting given my mother's tightly wounded aversion to sugar. <laughs> my grandmother collects the mayonnaise smeared paper plates and shoes us away. It's a beautiful night. You need to get going, she says to me. Wait, we're in the middle of nowhere. We're going somewhere, I ask? She respond, my mother says, I read they have a really nice playground here that gives me a wink. I am so excited I can barely contain myself. <laughs> my parents, both on each side of me, hold my hand as they escort me down the gravel road, lined with statues of Yogi and Boo Boo. <laughs> my father normally enjoyed picking me up as we walked, swinging me around, putting, a shoulders on, uh, putting me on his shoulders, whatever he has to do to engage my play. But tonight he is quiet, as is my mother. 1981 had been a chilly year. Several months earlier when I was playing with my father's marbles under my father's desk in his office, I told him, I don't like being seven, I miss being six. He took my words very seriously, why is that son? Well, you and mom give me headaches when you talk and you give me headaches especially when you don't talk. He quietly nods, knowing this is not a callous insult or brat speak, but genuine concern for my happiness. Being eight will be much better, he says. I want to believe him. We arrive at the playground. My mother looks at my father for an empty moment. My mother is madly in love with being a mother, <clears throat> and she could be warm like the tungsten silhouette of her auburn hair. Her life's wish was to have three children who love the Chicago Cubs, with just an inch less fervor than they loved Jesus. <laughs> she is kind but opinionated, loving, but her moods could be unhinged at times and she doesn't handle stress well. She was like a Joe March, who never left for the big city but rather just worried a lot and believed her Lord and Savior to be a socialist hippie who surely disapproved of Reagan. <laughs> we were in the fade after magic hour, where you can still see clearly lightning bugs begin to glow where the crickets have yet to sing. I see my mother on the bench. She is happy, serene. She is usually animated, excitable. This is unlike her. We play in the jungle gym for an exceptionally long period when my mother comes running over to us. She is suddenly back to her old self. There is a path over there. Growing up in the woods, burning our backyard, this is nothing to be excited about. <laughs> my father and I look and there is an unremarkable clearing in the trees. There are no signs and we're now fully in the vastness of night, so there's no way of knowing where the path leads or how deep it is. Well, I wonder where it goes. Let's, let's check it out, she says. Now, I want to be clear. My mother spent most of her free time worrying about my safety. I was what you call coddled. I grew up in a very isolated modern family subdivision, which was made up almost entirely of cul-de-sacs. My mother did not allow me to ride my bike beyond our cul-de-sac for the remote possibility of being abducted by teenagers and forced to drink beer and or joining a satanic cult. <laughs> I would be in my 30s before I can convince my mother to try Chinese food. <laughs> so the whole off the beaten path thing, especially when it's dark, steep, and unmarked, really wouldn't be her go-to thought process. And me questioning my mother certainly would not be my go-to. But we do it. 
we descend into the path. It is very dark, but there's a single lantern hanging from the trees about 30 feet in. Somehow, this illumination makes the path slightly creepier. We nervously stand at the entrance for several moments, mesmerized. Do you hear that? My mother asks. Just crickets in the distance. Then S's and P's and T's. The faint sound of voices somewhere in the thick of the darkened forest. Inexplicably, my mother pulls us down into the darkened, serpentine semi-walkway with occasional railroad ties a step towards the voices. This is weird. I am concerned. I cannot see my parents' faces. After what feels like five minutes of walking through the darkened brush, there is a clearing. It is a dock. We have arrived at a lake. <laughs> Sorry. Not a round lake, but one with twists and bends. It almost looks like a river, but it is still. The moon and its reflections in the ripples are the only illumination. I can see my parents' faces again. They are standing on the dock. An elderly couple and another family. They gently, very slowly turn to look at us as if we were intruding. They just stare. And I, shy to strangers and deficient in world experience, can only stare back, sensing this may not be normal. My mother asks, what are y'all doing? They look at her for a moment, at us. The elderly woman forces a smile and says, we are waiting for the boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, says my mom. <laughs> Sounds good. As if really saying, we also will wait for the boat. <laughs> Not quite reading the room. And so we just <laughs> and so we just stand there for probably ten minutes with the six other strangers on a dock on a lake at the end of a random unmarked path, waiting for a boat. The strangers occasionally whisper amongst themselves, occasionally look at us. We don't respond. We just <laughs> wait on the fucking dock for a fucking mystery boat. My mother looks at me and gives me that look of, isn't this great? <laughs> <laughs> it is quiet on the dock, then a distant motor. It comes around the bend, a red ferry. Hello, says the captain with a jolliness that is somewhat forced. Would you like to take a ride? <laughs> sure, shouts my mother with the gusto of a cheerleader. Everyone else, in sync, slowly turns to look at her. She pays them no mind, but we let the others enter first. He cranks the engine and we depart from the dock into the middle of the very dark lake ahead. <clears throat> we move past the bends and twists, come into a larger clearing resembling a standard lake before entering other bends and twists. Everything around us is pitch black, darkness, for a good 10 minutes, except for the August Indiana sky. It is silent, stands for the motor, and the small waves the boat produces. My parents were the national amateur champions in doubles for tennis several years in a row. One of the reasons they bought the camper was so that they could focus on more local tennis tournaments as they had a young family. Their technique was like a slickly oiled psychic machine, knowing what the other would do several steps ahead. They also spoke this way, often finishing each other's sentences. But since I had turned seven, they had begun to lose. Not only had they had stopped finishing each other's sentences, they stopped talking to one another. They stopped talking to me. There were several occasions in which both parents had forgotten to pick me up from school. But when I was six and before, I was their world. But now, we are on a boat, on a dark lake, with six other people, probably body snatchers, and that it happens. Possibly the biggest surprise of my life up to this point. The dark sky reflects something incandescent from below. There's light emitting from a hill on a bend. Behind the trees, there is something very bright. The teaser trailer from Close Encounters of the Third Kind comes to mind. 
but instead of a single road, it is an entire tree-covered hill. So more war of the worlds, but less ominous, more wondrous. We begin to hear voices, a crowd of sorts. There are screams, definite screams. But what is happening to them is such a familiar sound. How can there be screams? We're literally in the middle of nowhere. We come around the bend and then an assault of the senses. The sounds are as defined as the images that match. It is a roller coaster. It is a Ferris wheel. And it's thousands of matching white light bulbs and perfect lines. There in front of me, on this random lake in the middle of nowhere, the skyline of an amusement park. I am in the middle of a goddamn real life Ray Bradbury book. <laughs> I look to my parents. Their plan worked. My dad laughs and my mother winks. They knew all along where the path led. We ride one ride this particular evening. It is dark and getting ready to close. But the next day, my grandparents, also part of the scheme, watched my baby sister so my mother and father could take me to the park on the beach. I remember my, other, my, I remember my mother being fascinated with the ice in her water, calling it the most beautiful ice she had ever seen and wishing she could take it back with us to Decatur. <laughs> I remember running to make the departing riverboat and tripping on the dock, but keeping my ice cream level so as to not drop it as I knew that would be the last time I would be allowed that much sugar for a year. <laughs> it was a perfect day, and I could seem to do no wrong. My parents' attention was laser focused on me. <clears throat> so I was not going to pay any mind to the tension I was feeling between the two of them, which in hindsight I recognized was the elusive and undiagnosed source of my headaches. No, today it was easy to ignore the indefinable nebulous and happiness that had been plaguing my house since I had turned seven because I, basks, because I savored basking in every moment that was the splendor of my parents' heat ray of love. I got to ride the rides and eat the ice cream and I didn't have my baby sister around to steal my thunder. I wanted to stay and it's perfection to last forever. As cliche as, as, cliche as it sounds, I distinctly remember thinking that. The cliches are generally true, especially nothing lasts forever. The first thing my parents did was sell the camper to pay for the lawyer fees. My parents wanted to give me one last day as a family together, giving me the one thing I loved the most before they separated to divorce the following month, which is why they wanted to focus entirely on me and not each other. It was also all they could bear to do. I grew up and remained in love with amusement parks. I find great joy in the manufactured happiness, rose-tinted, or sats version of the world. While the magical castle is fake, the emotions are not. And some of my happiest moments alive have been within their perfectly gardened grounds, diligently cataloging the memories of these days, because I know these moments are as ephemeral as a youthful Midwestern August night. I had learned that Indiana Beach, my parents' mysterious theme park, closed due to COVID. I felt a, a despairing pain in my chest, not, for the, not just for the loss of one of my beloved amusement parks, but for the temporary reprieve of the heartache of some kid who doesn't get to spend the day with their family, consumed by the joy of the phosphorus and skyline. I'm grateful to my mother for giving me this memory. She hoped I would not forget, and I have not. Thank you.